I grew up in a country life. My wife did too, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on, I think it's Wednesday. We're telling a little bit more about our personal story. And, uh, but tonight I want to just begin with a, a little bit of introduction into the how to get the job done, you know, so it becomes believable and achievable for you. And for those that are listening in uh, internet land or on TV or wherever the satellites may be taking the message tonight, a lot of the stuff I'll cover has been kind of pertinent to our life. It's our particular area. And so it's, it's not going to necessarily cover every application that could possibly be uh, thought up out there, but hopefully you'll kind of read between the lines and glean out of it some things that might be inspiring to you. And uh, so hopefully that will help. This is a picture of our place, looking at it from up on a hill. And uh, we'll have a few more slides that are specific to our place. Some of them we just got the pictures because they bring the point home. We've all heard about why we should consider country living, but I'm going to primarily focus on successfully achieve how to achieve it, and I already brought that up to point. But before we do, I'd like to ask God's blessing on our message here tonight so that you will open your hearts, open your minds, and, and uh, hopefully I'll be a good voice for God in this endeavor here. Gracious Father in heaven, we do indeed count it a privilege to be able to share, to convey some thoughts uh, to folks here and around the country, wherever the satellite uh, signal goes, that they too might be able to uh, incorporate some of these thoughts and ideas into their life, make it a plan of action and uh, one that uh, they can believe in and achieve. And we certainly are hoping that uh, the message gets conveyed in that manner. And may we do, and whatever we say here tonight be done, because you've impressed our hearts and our minds to say it and to hear it in the right frame. And we just want to say thank you for this honor, for this privilege, and thank you for each person that's here tonight, each family represented. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I've always liked this picture. It's uh, being in the horse world that I have been. <clears throat> this one here says lots to me. I really dislike the thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. When making a big decision to move into the country, uh, you'll no doubt face opposition from what I like to call the NIOPS of the world. And the NIOPS means is the negative influences of other people. And <clears throat> I know that uh, we've had people express, why do you want to live out there? You know, you're so far from everything. And uh, we're 10 miles to the nearest town. And the town has 850 people in population and it has no stoplights and uh, a few stop signs. And that's about it. So when I come down here and I get stuck in traffic that's uh, miles long and bumper to bumper here and there, I, uh, I really like to enjoy the country life and the quietness. <clears throat> Thank you. Excuse me for a minute. That'll help. So anyway, let's continue on here with some more thoughts. It reminded me of the story of Nehemiah. I had just, as I was preparing this message, I had just finished reading this story in Nehemiah. So it, it said, man, that really points, it drives the point home. Because uh, when he was impressed to go rebuild the temple, and uh, he certainly faced a lot of opposition. He was laughed at, he was ridiculed, and obstructed in about every way possible. But his faith in God and, and in his mission was uh, steadfast, and he just hung in there and he kept doing it. He stayed focused on the mission, didn't he? And uh, Mrs. White had something to say about that experience I thought was interesting. She said that success attending Nehemiah's efforts shows what prayer, faith, and wise energetic action will accomplish. Living faith will prompt to energetic action. I'd like to draw an emphasis to that word energetic action. We have to have motion and get something rolling before God actually steps in, I think. He, he encourages us, he'll impress us, but he wants us to get involved, and he wants us to put forth some effort. And so it was no different in Nehemiah's time than it is now. We all have to proceed forward with some sort of uh, action with our prayers. And here's another promise found in Joshua 1.9, and it says, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So as we are pondering, well, where do we go if you're living in a bigger city or a metropolitan area? Where do we go? 
Well, God will divide, de- design a path forward for you. And uh, we'll talk some more about that here in a moment. And John 16.24 encourages us to ask and we shall receive. And it says, hitherto, for, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name? Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. And there's more. In case you need one more, there's a powerful one in Psalms. It says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. So there's no excuse for us not to think that God won't be with us. I think if we prayerfully seek his guidance, he wants to provide for us these answers. And we just need to encourage ourselves through prayer and one another and uh, to be a source of encouragement and help to one another. And one thing I want to stress, though, is that we don't want to procrastinate like Lot did because we all know how that story ended. And that story is all too real, folks. That could be today. That could be an experience that we might experience today. And uh, I think there's a lot to learn in that particular lesson. But what did Abraham do? He chose the open country, didn't he? And uh, God certainly blessed his efforts. And he didn't have to deal with the problems that Lot had to deal with. So... uh, Challenging, yes, I'm sure there's challenges, but uh, he chose the right path, and so we need to learn from these experiences. So I've got divided this in seven steps, and I don't have them necessarily numbered as one, two, three, four, seven, but I kind of went down through them, and there's kind of like seven points of interest here that uh, I bring up and as we can talk about things. I want to pray for guidance and wisdom, and know that God will be with you as you transition from city living to country living. And uh, I think as we've experienced in California here in the last few days, most of you are very well aware of what living in a bigger area when things don't go quite right, the power gets shut off and all the issues that transpire with that and uh, some of the other things that we're hearing about on the news that uh, gives us cause for concern and uh, we don't want to wait too long. So let's get with the program, I guess they would say. Consult with others. This is something you might consider doing. Consult with others who may already be enjoying a country lifestyle. So if it's new to you, don't be afraid to ask questions. You may want to view some of David Westbrook's YouTube on the subject. Uh, Most of you have seen some of his, and he covers a lot of stuff. Uh, He more or less, at least the ones that I've seen, pretty much deals with uh, why we need to move into the country. And uh, I kind of agree with a lot of what he says, but I want to deal primarily with, with the how, like I mentioned earlier. And then pray some more, and then, of course, what is that last word? Take action. So we've got to get uh, with uh, an action plan. And another thing you might consider is getting a copy of Country Living. It's a, it's a book uh, that Ellen White uh, they compiled with some of her writings out of various other uh, books. And, and it's got some really good uh, comments in there, and they're probably available at most ABCs, I would think. And uh, it has, as a matter of fact, I've got a couple of quotes out of this book in my presentation tonight. So now you might start looking for areas you might like and where you sense God might be calling you to go. And uh, that could be a big question for a lot of folks. You know, well, where? You know, you start looking. It's a big world out there. Where do you start looking? And uh, Wednesday we'll be telling a little bit of our story and uh, how we ended up where we ended up. And so that same policy or or process might work for you as well. But certainly... uh, Pray about it. And the things to consider that are extremely important is climate and your growing season and your weather patterns. And uh, some questions to ask yourself, is it prone to flooding? And and, uh, also, what about fires? Uh, We've experienced two of those where we live. We'll talk about that some more, I believe, on Wednesday. And uh, tornadoes, you don't want to live in Tornado Alley, as they say, or Alligator Alley. I've heard about that down there in southern Florida. And there's a lot of places that I've got friends that live in uh, uh, north, uh, kind of northeast Texas. And uh, every year I talk to them and I wonder if they're growing web feet because they've been flooded out two years in a row. And so it's, it's, you got to try to pick a spot where you're not likely to get, you know, end up with some of these problems. I don't think any place is foolproof, but you can minimize your exposure. So climate and growing season is probably one of the bigger things to consider. My motto has always been, and it continues to be, mountains, creeks, and trees. That was my motto when I looked for the place that we found. I love mountains. God speaks to me a lot through mountains. Just the, the idea of mountains. It, 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 they're majestic. They're peaceful. And uh, there's just something about a mountain in your background that just creates an atmosphere. And I love trees. 
Trees create a lot of fresh air because, you know, they breathe in the carbon dioxide that we exhale and they create oxygen that we breathe. So it's a cycle of life that God created for planet Earth and it works very well. And, of course, some water around doesn't hurt a bit. And uh, we've got all three of those where we live and, and uh, we've been really, really blessed. And, and just the air, the pure air that you can enjoy with the crick running by, the ions in the air is just a, it's full of energy and, and it just creates a wonderful atmosphere. And, there's some benefits to living in the country life, and, and uh, I won't necessarily read all those. You can kind of scan down through them, but there's some things there that just really think about the stimulation of your, your, your blood and your, just the healthy invigoration of, of, uh, of the exercise that you get. There's certainly a lot of exercise. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. If you ever want something to do, just buy a country property because you'll never run out of projects, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> uh, it's a healthy lifestyle. And uh, I just can't say enough about that. There's lots of fresh air and sunshine. Vitamin D is one of our best vitamins that your body needs for to build your immune system. It does so much for your body. You get a lot of that when you get a lot of sunshine. And uh, so that's one of the things that God has certainly created for our bodies to absorb. And exercise, you will definitely will have lots to do. And uh, I don't know whose garden this is. It's a picture my wife picked up, but it uh, looks like they're doing pretty good there. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a fun life to, to sit down at your dinner table, and my wife will remind me, everything in this salad or everything and whatever she's got there come out of our garden except maybe one item or whatever. You know, it's a, She just reminded me that we're eating the fruits of our labor, and it's so tasty and good. And I know there's other folks in here that have nice gardens. I've been up to Igor's place, and boy, they raise a big one. And uh, so uh, they enjoy the fruits of their labor as well. <clears throat> It's a great place to raise a family, too. Uh, can't beat the, the responsibilities and the work and the exercise that young kids can develop. I grew up on a small farm, and I know my wife did, and probably perhaps some of you in here have, too. And it's a, it's a lifestyle that I would not trade for anything. It has developed a character. Uh, my dad taught me how to work, that's for sure. And uh, he didn't teach me about the Lord, necessarily. He wasn't involved in that part too much. He didn't object to it, but it wasn't his thing. But he did teach me honesty, integrity, and some other character traits, and certainly how to work. And I'm never afraid of work. I just uh, have trouble turning, saying no to work sometimes. <clears throat> Cost of living, of course, is much less, especially if you raise a lot of your own produce. And uh, do it back like they did in the days that this picture is portraying. It's, uh, it's quite a life. You, know, you can see they cooking over the fireplace and... and uh, it's an interesting, uh, they've got their produce there on the counter and probably graze pretty much everything. I imagine they've got a few chickens outside and probably a cow or two to milk. And, and uh, actually, I have a nephew that's on my wife's side of the family. He calls me Uncle Jack, but he's a, he's a second cousin, I believe, on my wife's side. And they've got seven boys. I think him and Igor's family are having a competition. <laughs> but, but anyway, they're, they're, they all live in the same general area too, by the way. And it and, uh, must be in the air up there. But they, they really raise a good garden and they raise most of their produce and they, they have a couple of cows and, and the kids are raising chickens and selling the eggs and the kids are all involved. I mean, the little guys all the way up through the one, the oldest one, I think is like 10 or 11, something like that. And, uh, and they're so they're, they're actively involved and it's a real thrill to go there and watch those kids work. You know, they, the, the oldest one is taking on the responsibility. Now, I think he's 11. Is he 11 or 12? Somebody, no, 12. And... And so it, it, just to see the kids take their responsibility seriously and they're not involved in, you know, playing with whatever things you see kids playing with nowadays, all these internet gadgets. And uh, they, uh, they've got chores to do and, and they do them diligently and the younger ones are picking up the little bits of things along the way. So it's a, it's a powerful lesson for the young people to learn some of these alternate lifestyles. Now this is inside our garden. Uh, when I say inside, because there's a big greenhouse over the top of it. And uh, Lynn does a tremendous job of keeping me well fed with her efforts in there. And she spends a lot of time out there when she isn't in preparing for these meetings. And uh, it's a much more peaceful and quiet place. That is a picture of our humble little cabin. And uh, it wasn't, I'll share more with you on Wednesday about how that transformation that took place on this place, it was, it was something else uh, when we first moved there. And uh, it's still not big. It's about 1,000, 1,200 square feet, one bedroom, maybe two bedroom if you count my wife's office. 
and uh, uh, that deck there is this is a pine tree right there if you can see it with that little metal thing around it that was to keep a squirrel from climbing it because he he kept going up there and digging off the pine cones and dropping them on the house and dropping them everywhere and finally I had to slow him down a little bit so we put that in but that tree is now gone they logged our place uh, this summer and and we decided that tree probably should uh, go bye-bye. So they come in with this great big thing and crunched it and picked it up and set it aside. And, and uh, so anyway, it's, it's no longer there. But it was fun while it lasted. Okay, your ten, children tend to learn faster about what it means to be productive and learn how to adjust to the responsibilities of adulthood easier, early, easier and earlier in their life. And uh, I just really uh, like to see young people taking part in, in the farm life. It's, I've watched young people grow up in two different camps, so to speak, and the ones that grow up on a farm and have chores to do and animals are around, those kids, without fail, tend to uh, take on adult responsibilities earlier in life and much more effectively. And they're more mature, they don't seem to get into near as much trouble, and there's just a, it's a lot to be said about raising your family in a country life. You learn how to be much more self-sufficient and not so dependent on the system. And believe me, that really happens, especially in our case. We learned a lot how to get that done. You're raising your own food, and, and uh, there's more things to think about, too, because neighbors tend to help each other more. It's easier to get to, to know them, and that really seems to be a blessing. And uh, you can share equipment, too. Uh, maybe one guy has a bulldozer, another one has something else, and... He needs a bulldozer and you need something, you know, you trade things around. And that happens a lot in the country life. Uh, we're always horse trading things around. I'm borrowing something from them and they're borrowing something from me. It always, it's a joy to be able to share your time and your talent. And, of course, neighbors usually have similar interests, beliefs, and ideology. Doesn't mean you agree on everything, but they're a whole lot closer to it sometimes than others. And it's a great witnessing opportunities. We've had uh, some neighbors that we've got to share with over the years and, and, uh, it's, it's really a blessing to be able to sit down and, and uh, share God's word with, with your neighbors. Spiritual growth is also so much easier without the noise and distractions of city living. And uh, my wife has mentioned on m numerous occasions that where we live, we have no active s uh, phone service. You ha we have to get ours. Uh, I'll bring it up early, later, but it comes through an uh, Internet uh, uh, satellite. So we're not plagued with constant ringing of telephones and, and uh, distractions of TV and sirens going off and the neighbor's noise down the street and all that stuff. So it's, it's really a peaceful place to study and uh, quiet, and, and we really appreciate that. Okay, there's also things to avoid. Most of us know why to avoid debt. And uh, we don't want to get in a stressful situation. I've been in debt, and it is not fun. And it takes a long time to bail yourself out. And so uh, how you handle your finances will, to a large degree, affect your spiritual life, you know, because you'll be making decisions trying to take care of the debt problem that perhaps maybe are not the best for your spiritual growth and so on and so forth. So uh, stay out of debt as much as you possibly can. doesn't mean that we don't all have some from time to time, but it needs to be manageable and... and uh, it's just something we need to watch out for. And then also, I'm a strong believer in no communal property ownership. And, and uh, some of you may understand why, uh, but I'll explain a little bit. You get in a rush to go get out of Dodge and want to go find a piece of country property, so you and your parents, maybe you and your siblings, maybe you and a good friend, decide to go buy a piece of property together and you build your house over there and I'll build my house over here and we'll just be one big happy family. And... Uh, Life happens, and the next thing you know, the, somebody's got something going on, maybe somebody dies, and then the heirs come in, and now they're who you have to deal with, and they don't have the same spiritual plane as you do. There's a whole lot of things that can go wrong with that kind of an arrangement. So if you have to partner up with somebody, uh, make sure you get private ownerships. Maybe you've got a 10-acre piece, and you're both buying it together to get a better deal on a larger piece, break it in half, get separate deeds, and everything for, keep everything separate. You'll remain friends a whole lot longer and uh, life will be a lot easier. So if you want more questions and answers on that, we'll have a questions and answers session down on Wednesday, hopefully. But then how do I make a living, some of you might be asking. I asked that same question. So I was in the trucking business for quite a number of years because I could live where I wanted to live and I could just drive around and I'd show up at home once in a while. 
and uh, it wasn't always the most fun career to have, but it did provide for our needs. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about options to how to make a living, living in the country, because a lot of you people live in the bigger cities because why? That's where you make your living. That's where the jobs are. That's where all the action happens, and so you want to be involved in that. I get that, and uh, so it's tough to, to transition out of it. But there are ways to do it, and perhaps uh, you can get some ideas here. So you might ask yourself, what talents, interests do you possess? You can start a business. I always said, find a need and fill it. And I don't care how small the town is, there's always a need. There's always something there that could be uh, filled. Uh, you can get creative. You have no idea what God can do in and through you. Just ask him and listen. And then again, take action. Remember, he didn't part the Red Sea until they took a big step of faith. I'm sure somebody got their toes wet before the water started parting. <laughs> I kind of pictured that that way anyway. <clears throat> There's a lot of people nowadays that work remotely on the Internet. Uh, with the advent of the Internet, and you can get Internet almost anywhere in the world now because of satellite arrangements like we use. And uh, I'm surprised the number of people I've actually talked to that are retiring into smaller communities because, hey, I don't need to be in a big city anymore because I can do everything I do on the Internet. They send everything back and forth, and I don't really know how all that stuff kind of works. I've got a pretty good idea, but I've never had to do that necessarily. But uh, it can be done. So if your career, whatever it is that you do, uh, is geared towards that kind of an environment, then by all means, uh, take advantage of that and go find yourself a piece of country property and do your work from there. And anyway, something else you can do is start an organic farm and a produce business. Who knows, it could be so successful you may have to hire a whole bunch of people that are wanting to move to the country and need some work. So that's a great way to get that going. And uh, the organic food industry is growing by leaps and bounds. Have you ever noticed just recently in stores, I don't know if in your area, but we're at... The organic section used to be about this big. And now you go into some stores and it takes up the whole aisle. And you can go around in the store and find organic stuff everywhere. So it's, it is growing and uh, more and more people are requesting it. And I think the more people that request it, the more it will be available. And so if you're interested in that kind of industry, you could certainly uh, create a, a business built around that. You could start a health food store in conjunction with that. Or if you're handy and can manage contractors and do fix and flip houses like I've been doing recently, there's always a need for housing. So uh, that's something you could do. I've got a few pictures coming up now that shows one that we just did. This was a house that it's up in Kamii, Idaho. Bought it at an auction and uh, took all the front porch looking stuff off of there and, and uh, this is what that front house side of the house looks like now. And uh, took that old thing off and we changed it. We put a lot of money into this house and spent a lot more than I ever dreamed we would. But uh, we still made a little profit on it and, and I lived through it. <laughs> That's the back side of the house. The other side, that porch. When I first went to look at this house before I actually bid on it, this piece was already fell off. It was down here somewhere. Uh, if you can see where I'm pointing, where that little step way is there. Maybe is there a pointer on this thing? Probably is. But anyway, that little step thing up there, it, it had already collapsed. And... Uh, and I, I had to jump from there to the, up there to just to get through that door that the weather had changed the floor. It wet, got wet, and it sw so it wasn't shut. And I could see that I could get in there, so I risked trying to take a peek inside. <laughs> anyway, that's what that side of the house looks like now. And uh, it turned out really well. We just got it sold about two months ago, and, and big relief off of my shoulders. I would not do a project that extensive for a while. It was probably more than I bargained for. Anyway, if you have the talent to be a marketing genius on the Internet, I would be uh, willing to hire you, and so would many other people, because that's a weak point that I know a lot of people have, me included. There's a lot of work that can be done on the Internet nowadays, and things can be sold, bought, traded, and whatever. And uh, if you've got a talent for that kind of thing, you could start a business from home doing that for people, and they would flock to you, as I know I would. It's uh, something I don't want to learn. I don't have the time for it. I don't have the patience for it, but it's a necessary evil in today's world. So that's something that could be done very easily. The list is endless. The important thing is to get creative and take some action and ask our Heavenly Father to give you wisdom. And believe me, He will, and He does. On the other hand, maybe you're retired and income is not a big issue for you. You've got enough money to make your needs and so on and so forth, but Perhaps you could become a mentor or a helper or something for someone else who maybe needs a handout or a hand up, leg up or whatever you want to call it. And uh, 
So and find somebody who would be an inspiring mentor for you. And there's quite a few people out there. And, and, so, and if you're in that category that can be a mentor, then let it be known and you'd be willing to help others wanting to make the transition. And uh, what about electric power options? This happens to be our solar powerhouse that uh, uh, it wasn't operational at this point. We just got the building done, and it's not even quite done. I still got siding to put on it and stuff. And, and uh, we had it done almost a year before I got it actually operational. And uh, thanks to Igor, he took pity on me and come down and helped me do some wiring inside that white part there. It's got a different colored siding on it now. But anyway, we got the, some of the equipment put together, and we actually turned our solar power on, I think it was in early May. It was right after ta uh, Passover, because... Igor stopped with his family. We had a wonderful visit, and he spent almost a whole day down there helping me put some of the components together inside. And so we actually turned the power on, and, and it's been a real blessing ever since. So prior to that, uh, we used generators. And we had a big bank of batteries that we would charge with generators, and we lived 20, almost 28 years that way, believe it or not, and burned a lot of diesel and a lot of gas. And they went through a lot of generators because they would wear out and we'd need another one and you know how it is. And so anyway, they are a necessary backup for any kind of a system off-grid. If you've got water, uh, you can create a hydro thing of some form or another. This is just a water wheel. I don't know if it turns anything, but it gives you the idea. Here's a bunch of batteries. And uh, so store energy in those so that during the day when the sun's shining and fill those batteries up with lots of energy and then at night when the sun goes down, you can run your system off of those. More about that in a little bit. Here's some more hydro ideas. And uh, <clears throat> if you've got a stream someplace and you've got elevation drop, you can create power with it. And there's a company in Boise, Idaho called Aurora Power. I've dealt with those folks a little bit. They're very knowledgeable. They're not necessarily the cheapest around, but they are very good. And uh, they know a lot about uh, hydro plants and stuff. And so if you ever need any technical advice or equipment, they, uh, they can help you out with that, or there's others around too. Most properties today have power on site or nearby. However, if you're like us, it was four miles away when we first bought that place, and uh, 28 years ago is a long time, it seems like, and it would have cost us twenty or $250,000. That was 28 years ago. I'd hate to think what it charges today to get power run that four miles up the road. So we decided we could do without power. We'll buy a lot of diesel and generators for that difference in money. Of course, I had the long-term plan of either developing a hydro plant or solar or a combination of both, and we've got the solar pretty well uh, operational, so hydro is our next uh, step. Anyway, if you're on grid, most of you know what that means. You get a big bill every month and hope the power stays on, which it didn't here recently. And in most cases it does, but it didn't here. They turned it off, and you're certainly at their mercy. And uh, off-grid, this is how we've done it for 28 years. It's challenging but rewarding too, and this is where you create all of your own power. And most off-grid people have a combination of a generator and a batteries and, and uh, some solar. There's various configurations you can do there. And I'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about hybrids here or both. Uh, if you're on-grid power and you want to supplement your power, you can do that with solar really easy. And you feed the meter backwards and it offsets your power needs, so you can cut your power bill considerably with power. I think they do that here to some degree. I don't know exactly how this system operates here, but at any rate, uh, it is a very good, viable way to go. It's cheaper to install. You don't have to buy the batteries and a lot of the equipment that makes it work. Uh, that way you just need the solar panels and however it feeds it into the system, and, and it just offsets your existing power bill. Uh, that is a little cheaper to install, but there's no backup power with that, so you're still going to need a generator if the power does go off. And uh, so my suggestion, of course, is one that has batteries and, and uh, spend a little more money and get a more uh, system that's uh, self-contained. Then you've got to talk about heating. So here's uh, our wood shed when we got it full. Wood heat is still used extensively in many places, including ours. However, if you don't have very many trees where you live, this may not be a good option for you unless somebody's in the business of hauling firewood your direction. Uh, there's other options, though. But while we're talking on wood heat, wood heat's also a great way to heat your hot water. Um, I don't have this kind of a system installed. I got the parts to do it, but I've never had the time to take to do it. But you can heat your hot water or preheat your hot water, run through a tank like you see right there, and then it can go from there into your propane hot water tank, which is what we have, and uh, 
preheat all that hot water so you can cut your hot water bill almost to zero, and at least in the winter time when you have your wood stove going. And there's blueprints online. You can pick these up and kind of see how to fabricate that stuff. It's not real complicated. And uh, just a note about firewood. Uh, we cut down a great big tree next to this shed that's right behind me there. It was way too close to that shed, and I don't know if this is the bottom piece to it or not, but it, it was all my backhoe could do to pick it up in a 12-foot section. And one thing nice about firewood, you get twice as much heat out of it because you got to cut it, and that gets you nice and warm. And then when you burn it, you know, and of course when you pack it, if you got to pack it, I could probably add two or three more times to the... So that same stick of firewood will heat you up many times, and the last time it, it'll heat you up when you throw it in the wood stove. So, so there's a lot of benefits to firewood. Remember my mountains motto of mountains, cricks, and trees. Well, I love like living around big trees, and I love trees because I like firewood for heat. There's just something about that. I just like the sound of a crackling fire, and it makes it feel real cozy and, and uh, really enjoy it. But there are other, al other alternatives. Uh, one of them, of course, is wood pellets. It's a great option for those of you that don't have trees in your area. It, however, it does require electricity to make the auger work in the pellet stove. However, having said that, I do know there are a few mechanical pellet stoves. I've seen them. I've not ever experienced how they work. I don't know how effective they are, but they are available. It works on some kind of a gravity-fed operation. So that's one. And uh, I mentioned it already covered that. And uh, wood pellets might be a good option if you don't have firewood like we do. And so here's just a, one of our pictures of our busy woodcutting things. Lynn's gotten pretty good at running that splitter there. So, yeah. Another good option, fire bricks, I call them. And uh, if you don't want to use uh, wood pellets and you don't want to have that kind of a stove, that, but you still have a regular wood stove, these fire bricks are an excellent option. They're not too much more expensive than a quart of firewood if you used to buy it from somebody. And they, as you can see, there's quite a lot of benefits. They're clean. They don't take much place to store them, and they're very efficient heat. And uh, uh, they're built in several places. It's kind of a takeoff of the Presto log that we've seen years. It's a similar concept. They press sawdust into a, In this case, they press them into bricks. And a, a pallet of that stuff is equivalent to about a quart of firewood, so I've been told. And uh, so anyway, you get about the same amount of heat out of it. Of course, propane is a good source of energy. We use propane. We have a 1,000-gallon tank. This isn't our tank, but I don't know how big that one is, but it looks like a good size one. Uh, to run anything from lights, and these lights look real similar to some we have in our house. And uh, uh, they've got, if you notice the, the globe on those things, they make a, it's a kind of a replacement sort of a thing, aftermarket if you want to call it that. You know, you, most of you have seen those sock-looking things that you kind of pull the little string and tie them on. They don't work very good. Uh, they work, but they don't work very good. These are preformed, a little more money, and it takes a, a you got to buy the apparatus that goes up on there so it'll screw on and fit. But it, they work really well. They last a long time, put out a lot more light. And uh, so that's very similar. Of course, your cooking and refrigeration is, all, you can do that with propane. Um, somebody I was talking to earlier about these little catalytic heaters on the left there. Uh, that's, we have one of those going in our house right now while we're down here. We got it on low just to kind of keep the chill off. And, uh, of course, we have a propane cooking stove. Looks very similar to that white one there. And so you can do a lot with propane. It's relatively affordable. It's uh, storable. Uh, you know, it doesn't go bad on you. It just it's, it's a real good source of heat as long as we have access to somebody to keep the tank full. But it is a good off-grid source of cooking and heat and so on. And or you can cook outside. This is a couple of my brothers come to visit me a while back. And so we're cooking in the campfire pit out there. We're making cowboy hash. And uh, I'll be uh, doing some more of that here on Thursday for the over here in the cook tent. So if I could figure out how to make enough for everybody, I'd go out there in that great big tent, and I'd do it on another day for everybody. But, but I don't know how I'd manage that. I'd have to recruit a bunch of help, but it would be fun. That's an Amish-style cook stove, and uh, they are very efficient. It looks really close to the one we have in our house, as you'll see in the next picture. Uh, but they've got a little bigger firebox. We used to have uh, like those old style kitchen cook stoves, you know, it's got the little back on them and the little burner things you pick off and the burner box is only about this big and it burns wood really fast. Uh, well, that's what I grew up with. And uh, so we, I gave it to my one of my nephews and we, we have one like this in our house now and that's it sitting there on the left. And, uh, and then we've got an earth stove, kind of a wood stove there on the right. 
And uh, you can see we have electric lights because that lamp, that's proof that our system works and uh, it is on. Okay, internet and phone service. I talked on that a little bit earlier. We use uh, HughesNet and it costs us a little over $100 a month for the service and we, all we get on that is internet and phone and our phone works through the apparatus somehow or another and we do not have to have our computer on to make the phone work. So it used to be uh, when the system started out, at least the ones I was familiar with, you had to have your computer on and somehow it went through your computer. I didn't want that kind particularly, but we ended up getting this kind. It works really great. The only downside is a little bit of a lag. You know, so when I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, we've got to wait for a second or two before the conversation gets to the other end of the line. But it does work very well. And if you want TV, you can get it on there. We just don't have that. I'm going to make a quote from... Uh, Country Living, it's taken on page 17. The original quote came out of uh, Testimonies, uh, volume 6, uh, page 178. It says, if the land is cultivated, it will, uh, with God's blessings, uh, supply our needs and necessities. We are not to be discouraged about terrible things because of apparent failures, nor should we be disheartened by delay. We should work the soil cheerfully and hopefully, gratefully, believing that the earth holds in her bosom rich stores for the faithful worker to garner stores r richer than gold and silver. So there's proof in the pudding that it does actually work. Most of us know something about the subject of gardening and stuff, so I'm going to go into it in great detail here. We've had some really good presentations here on gardening uh, and some right here in Terrabella, so I'm not going to go into great detail there, but there's a lot of stuff available on the Internet and whatever. Uh, depending on your growing season, you might consider a large enough greenhouse to meet your family's needs. We have a good-sized one for our needs. This used to be our garden spot, and we just decided to it's got a chain link fence around it to keep the critters out. But we just built a greenhouse over our whole garden. And uh, it's very effective. It works very well. It's, uh, the downside is I've got to take that plastic cover off every year because it won't hold the snow that we get. And so it's a nuisance doing that. But other than that, it, it really works well. And here's inside the greenhouse to show that something does grow in there. And uh, Lynn has a really good green thumb. She just seems to grow all kinds of good things in there. We ate tomatoes. Man, they're so good. The cool room, we don't have a current one of these. I got one in the process of being time put together, but it's a really important thing someday to have a cool room, an underground storage, someplace to keep your efforts of your produce. Of course, canning and freezing and drying is always a good option for storing things. Now, how to acquire adequate housing. I see I'm going to have to kind of speed up a bit here. So <clears throat> a lot of things to think about in adequate housing when you want to move into the country. And like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but try to give you some things to think about. And... Uh, if you can't find a property that has a suitable home on it or one your budget allows, then there are still some options you may want to consider. And here's one of them. A little mini house. Most of you have seen those or they've advertised them around. They're actually, some of them are pretty nice. Here's another one, a little smaller maybe. Uh, I'm not suggesting you get one that small, but nevertheless, it, it is ideas to think about. And here's one that's got a cool idea. Got a little greenhouse on a trailer parked right upside of it. So uh, my mom, before she passed away, she dreamed of building something like that and she kept and want me to help her build something. And I think, well, there's a good example of what she was hoping for. And I'm not too familiar with these. Uh, Lynn found this picture of this passive dome tiny house can operate entirely off-grid. I don't know too much about it. I suppose you could go online and maybe Google it or something, but it looks kind of unique and interesting. Here's a really good option for some folks. It's an unfinished mini barn. Play up and down the highways. There's little mini storage things that you see everywhere. People buy them for storage things, but I know people that actually take them and finish them inside. And there's a company up in Montana that actually does do that. She'll, they'll finish them inside for you. You guys might be familiar with them. Uh, there's a the kid in council that I uh, sold a lot of my leather shop working stuff to. He sells those buildings from the outfit in Montana. And uh, they do finish them out if you want to go that route. You can spend forty to $100,000 on them. But uh, you can buy one of these for maybe eight to 10000 and finish it yourself, depending on how big you get. So... They are affordable and they're really kind of comfortable. Here's another option, RVs, pluses and minuses. Uh, <clears throat> this happens to be a picture of my sister and her husband's RV. They live up uh, out of Auburn, California, and they just that's how they live. They were going to build a big home, and, and uh, he got hurt and sick, or I don't remember exactly what happened, and they couldn't get it done, and then the building permits just kept going higher and higher and higher, so they just stay in the RV. And... Uh, so they've got it all fixed up around them. They've got a building over here off to the side. You can see on the right side there that uh, they've got a washer and a dryer and a big freezer, and they do a lot of outdoor cooking. And they've got 
landscaped up nice, it, they get by just really fine right there. And you can buy used RVs of that size for under $10,000. And the one we're staying in out here that Sandy bought, I know she probably paid less than that for that one. And they're very nice. And uh, the downside is <clears throat> how do you keep them warm in the wintertime? And uh, in California, it's not quite such a bad deal. But up where we live, it becomes a bad deal. So I've got this word down here, RV condos. I've been dreaming for years about how to build a place or a building that you could put one of them in that would stay warm enough in wintertime. So I just coined the phrase RV condo. I don't know. It's probably not the right word. but So it's a building you can back it into that's got its own windows all the way around and, uh, and a wood stove in there and a lot more room than what you'd need the RV. So like if your RV takes up 12 feet, you build another 12 feet wider than that. So you've got room for another bedroom, probably a laundry facility and extra stuff and a roll-up door in the front so when you want to leave and go somewhere you can disconnect everything or roll up the door drive out and uh, your RV is ready to go wherever you want to go when you come back and if it gets too cold and you want to stay warm uh, close the doors build a wood stove fire and your RV stays nice and toasty and warm and you don't have condensation build up on the walls like I dealt with all last winter so uh, anyway it's a it's a great option and it's an affordable option that's fairly quick so I want you to seriously consider that you could also build their own on a budget and uh, there's ways to do that. Here's a load of auction lumber I bought at an auction for that house that I showed you pictures of earlier. Uh, that's a brand new stove. I bought it at an auction for about 150 bucks and underneath that blue there is stainless steel. It's a nice nice frigid air stove. Up in the front of the load is some windows that I bought and uh, I probably paid thirteen hundred dollars for that whole load. So some of the boards are twisted. So you got to have some ways to deal with some of those. So I sorted out about 25% of those boards that I figured probably couldn't use, but the rest of them, uh, I've got equipment that I haven't been able to develop to make it work, so I call it, uh, take advantage of that. So anyway, there's ways to build that doesn't cost uh, as much as you'd think. And uh, if you need to buy tools, buy good ones. Uh, there are a lot of battery-operated tools nowadays that make construction work a lot easier. Water systems... <clears throat> We've got, uh, this is a gravity flow water system. We, at any given time at our place in the summertime, you'll see half a dozen or more of these little sprinklers going. And the downside is you've got to drag hoses everywhere. It's a little bit time consuming, but the water's free. Uh, it doesn't cost me anything to pump them. It all comes down a pipe that's gravity flow. And so we keep everything pretty well watered and green uh, around the place there. And this is, uh, shows where the water comes off of our main system. I've got a six inch water line in the ground and two inch lines branch off of it in various places to provide water. Uh, around the place. And we could even put a small turbine on that little pipe right there and create electricity. <laughs> so it, it would work. And then there's a lot of other things you can do from wells. Uh, uh, there's some interesting ways to develop. If, you, if the only way you can get water, you don't have a spring, you can d drill a well and uh, pump the water uh, with a, like a generator in a pump, pump the water up the hill into a big cistern if you've got a hill higher than your house, and then gravity flow back to your house so you don't have to run your generator all the time to get your water. Or if you if you want to pump it up into a tank by your house, the RV pump that we use in all these RVs out here that provide that pressurize our water systems, you can do that for your house just as easy and uh, runs on 12 volts and so you can pressurize your system. There's a lot of things you can do that are kind of creative that actually work pretty good. And uh, solar pumps, 12 volt RV pumps, there's a lot of things with solar nowadays that we didn't have available just a few years back. And of course, rainwater collection systems is another way to get water for various needs. And even if you have to pack water from another source, you can fill a tank under your house. Up there in Kamiai, where I was working on that house, there's quite a number of people that live up there that do not have wells. They go down the hill, there's a spring that comes out of the hill. They've got a big pipe, about yay big around, that comes out, and people then fill their tanks, and they'll go up there and they'll dump them in there. Then they either gravity flow to their house or they use a, some kind of a pump, probably 12 volt, like I was just talking about. So there's ways to get water. An emergency you can do what our pioneers did, you know, pack water in a bucket. And uh, a lot of us have had to do that at one time or another. Or septic systems are appropriate permits. If you're going to put in a real septic system, uh, the most places do require permits for that, or maybe you can get by with just a good old-fashioned outhouse. Push come to shove, we've all had to use one of them in a time or two, and uh, it, it works in an emergency. And then how to cool my home? And, uh, of course, there's all kinds of interesting ways to do that. That happens to be like a swamp cooler. They're not too expensive to operate, so it's one way to deal with that. And, of course, there's heat pumps and things you can do that don't use up a lot of energy. They're more efficient to use. You can put a greenhouse on the side of your house, 
and uh, heat your house a little bit with that in the wintertime, plus grow a lot of stuff there. And I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to have to make this real short. And uh, makeshift refrigerators. Have you ever heard of one of them with the burlap and water? Yeah, it, it actually works pretty good. And I've not personally done much with it, but I, I understand the concept, and, and uh, it will help. It's, uh, you can take an old, uh, uh, like a swamp cooler, the framework, take all the stuff out, the motor out, build your little shelves in there, and drape some burlap over the edge, pour water over the top of it, and as the water evaporates, it will cool your clothes. And propane clothes dryers are also a good option, or they're solar clothes dryers, called a clothes pin and a clothes line. <laughs> in closing, now it's your turn to put a plan in place and action. You know, the big question is, what's holding you back? And uh, there's no time better than right now to be seriously contemplating what your next step's going to be. And uh, I'd like to read this in quote here, the final quote that I've got. It's uh, taken from Country Living. <clears throat> it's very valuable, so take it to heart. It says, Let there be nothing done in disorderly manner that there shall be a great loss or sacrifice made upon property because of ardent, impulsive speeches, which stir up an enthusiasm which is not after the order of God. That a victory was essential to be gained shall, for the lack of level-headed moderation and proper contemplation and sound principles and purposes, be turned into defeat. Let there be a wise generalship in this matter, and all move under the guidance of a wise and unseen counselor, which is God. Elements that are human will struggle for the mastery. That there may be work done that does not bear the signature of God. Now I plead with every soul to look not too strongly to, and confidently to human counselors, but look most earnestly to God, the one wise in counsel. Submit all your ways and your wills to God and God's will. And uh, that's it. So I hope that inspires you. Uh, let you know it's a believable. I realize it's pretty fast, a lot of information. And uh, we will have a questions and answers session, hopefully, on Wednesday. Uh, if somebody has a particular question, or if you just catch me running around and you got something you'd like to know, or something to kind of, a little clarification on something, I'd be happy to do that. So, anyway, shall we stand for a closing prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we do count it a privilege to share the goodness of uh, creation that you've created for us and the, just the pleasure of being able to enjoy the great outdoors and the country lifestyle that some of us currently enjoy. I know others would like to be able to get there. We pray that the information shared here tonight will be a source of inspiration to believe that it's a believable and achievable goal for them and that as we seek to do your will in this matter, we've been counseled for you many, many years to make this a part of our lifestyle, and uh, some of us have procrastinated a little too long, but we know that there's still a little time left, and we need to make that move, make that choice, and make that decision to make it a part of our plans going forward, and to do it with a lot of prayer, a lot of counsel, a lot of thoughts, and uh, a lot of leading from you. And we depend on you to lead and direct in that area of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>